Hello everybody and welcome to this presentation on integrated broadband analog delay circuits. My name is Tony Chan Carasoni and I'm from the University of Toronto. I put this presentation together because I realized that we've been implementing and using analog delay circuits in my lab for about 20 years now and yet there's still interesting work to be done on and with them. And at the same time, some technology trends that we'll discuss are making these circuits increasingly useful and practical. So I thought that the time was right to put together this summary presentation. If you want to dig deeper into any of the information you'll hear about here, you can feel free to visit my lab's website at the University of Toronto, isl.utoronto.ca. Let me just start with a quick outline of the presentation. We'll begin by defining broadband continuous time analog de delays and motivating our interest in them. Then we'll provide some background, including definitions of an ideal delay, how we might quantify the delay of a continuous time linear time invariant system, and how we may shape its response to approximate an ideal delay. Then we'll look at integrated circuit implementations of analog delay circuits, both passive and active. And I'll make some concluding remarks at the end. Now the focus of this talk is going to be on continuous time analog broadband delay circuits. But before we dive into that, I'd just like to begin by distinguishing between continuous and discrete time delays and look at some of the trade-offs associated with them. So to have a discrete time delay, it has to be preceded by a sampling operation. And sampling is going to imply some aliasing. If we have aliasing, then in general, we have to precede the sampling operation with an anti-aliasing filter. So that's some extra hardware that's required when we're going to use discrete time delays for signal processing. Moreover, in many systems, feedback is being used to determine the precise timing of the sampling operation. So that means that introducing discrete time delay circuits after the sampling operation and as part of the feedback loop will introduce some latency in that timing recovery loop that can have negative consequences. On the bright side, discrete time delays are determined by the clock period and so therefore can easily be changed over a wide range of delay values just by changing the clock frequency. Continuous time delays, on the other hand, typically embed inherent anti-aliasing within them. So you kind of get a two for one for free. Moreover, since continuous time delays are placed prior to any sampling, they shorten the latency associated with any timing recovery loops. However, implementing tunable continuous time delays can be more difficult, especially if we want to tune the delays over a very wide range of delay times. There are also trade-offs associated with the typical circuit implementations of discrete and continuous time delay circuits. Discrete time delay circuits typically use switch capacitors that are driven by either open or closed loop amplifiers or buffers, depending on the linearity requirements of the application. Here I'm just showing an open loop source follower, for example. So what happens is that after the switch is open and or closed, you've got a spike of current that's flowing onto or off of the switched capacitor. And that in a typical implementation is riding on top of some bias current that has to be maintained in the buffer amplifier. So this is a sort of inherent source of nonlinearity present in most discrete time delay circuits or samplers. On the other hand, with continuous time delay elements, some amplifier specs can be relaxed because the current is flowing continuously and their sort of peak to average ratio of current that needs to flow in the driving amplifiers is reduced. So although discrete time delay circuits are useful or even ideal for some applications, we've given some reasons now why we're particularly interested in continuous time delay circuits. So I'd next like to further categorize analog delay circuits and distinguish between narrowband and broadband or baseband delay circuits. Narrowband delay circuits are useful for varying the delay of clock signals or narrowband RF signals. So these can be useful in applications such as clock skew and de-skew, or for providing clock or oscillator phase shifts or interpolating between oscillator phases to realize new uh, clock phases. 
Such circuits are often used, for example, in wireless beamforming to um, allow for programmable phase shifts of many versions of the same clock. On the other hand, we're focused here on baseband, broadband analog delay circuits. These are useful for delaying broadband communication circuits, for example, while preserving their wave shape precisely. These are used in many different applications. For example, we'll look at FIR and IR filters using broadband delays. Distributed amplifiers make use of broadband delays. Time interleaving, uh, the alignment of a signal with a fixed clock can require a broadband delay. And it can also be used for pipeline analog signal processing without sampling. So this really is then the focus of this presentation. So having motivated our interest in continuous time broadband analog integrated delay circuits, let's next look at some of the background information we'll need for our study in this area. And specifically, we're gonna take a look at ideal and continuous time delay approximations. So when we think about the response of an delay circuit, let's begin by thinking about the response of an ideal time delay, D. That's a linear time invariant system that therefore can be described by its impulse response. And for an ideal time delay, that'll be a delta function arising here at D, where D is the delay of the system. Now that impulse response has a Fourier transform that is the frequency response, e to the negative j omega D. So we can consider now the magnitude and phase responses of the ideal delay. The magnitude response is constant at unity across all frequencies. And the phase response is a linear function of frequency omega. So specifically, it's this linear function of omega plotted here with a slope of negative d, where again, d is the time delay of the system. We can therefore make sense to define the delay of a general transfer function, t, in terms of its um, phase response. So the delay of a system T will be in general a function of its frequency, and it's just the ratio of the phase response to omega. So again, for the ideal delay, that would give us, uh, what, as we expect, the delay D. Now, although it's very difficult to realize an ideal time delay uh, with an integrated circuit, we can try and approximate that with some transfer function t. And if we want it to serve as an ideal time delay for signals that are band limited within a certain frequency range, omega one to omega two, then the criteria we'd like to meet is that it has a magnitude response uh, of t that's constant over that frequency range, and that it has a delay given by this ratio here that is also constant across that frequency range. This definition of delay in terms of phase response is also sometimes referred to as phase delay. Now another metric we often use to quantify the delay of an LTI system is its group delay. The group delay is slightly different than the delay or phase delay that we defined on the last slide. So let's take a look at that. The group delay is the derivative of the phase response of an LTI system T with respect to frequency. So note that if we have an LTI system with a constant delay or phase delay, as we defined it on the last slide, that would imply that it also has a constant group delay across that same frequency, because it would imply that the phase response is a linear, perfectly linear function of frequency. However, the opposite is not necessarily true. That is, constant group delay doesn't necessarily ensure constant delay. And the two physically are different so to be specific, we should remember that constant group delay ensures that the envelope of the signal experiences a constant delay, but not the signal itself. In order for the waveform itself to experience a constant delay and preserve its shape precisely, it's the delay that we defined here, or phase delay as we called it, that must be constant over the frequency range of interest, as well as keeping a magnitude response constant across that frequency range. So to illustrate the difference between constant group delay and constant delay, let's consider a toy example where we're interested in the frequency range from omega one at 100 hertz to omega two at one kilohertz. 
and let's consider the output of two different linear time invariant systems to inputs within that frequency range. So let's consider the red curve here, a system that has a phase response as shown here. This is a system that is contrived to have a perfectly constant group delay across the frequency range of interest, omega 1 to omega 2, but does not have a constant phase delay, or does not have constant delay as we defined it. Uh, on the other hand, let's consider an LTI system with a phase response plotted in green here. This system has perfectly linear phase response uh, all the way down to DC and therefore exhibits constant delay as well as constant group delay across the frequency range of interest. Now let's subject both these two systems to a two-tone input, superposition of two tones, one at omega-1 and one at omega-2. And let's see what the output of these two systems are. So on the left here, we see the output of the system with constant delay. When subjected to the two-tone input plotted in blue, we get at the output the waveform in green, which is an exact copy of the waveform in blue, but precisely shifted over by the time delay D of that system. You can see that every peak in the blue waveform corresponds to a peak in the green waveform, and the troughs also are just shifted over in time by D seconds, and the shape of the waveform is preserved. On the other hand, if we subject the red system with constant group delay to the same input waveform blue, we see the output is slightly different. The output in red is no longer the exact same shape. The peaks are not just shifted in time, they change in amplitude so as to maintain a constant group delay. That is, uh, the envelope is delayed in time, but the actual wave shape is changed. So here we just superimpose the two plots so that the difference is perfectly clear. Again, the green waveform represents the output of the constant delay system, but the red waveform is the output of the one with constant group delay, where we see the envelope is delayed. So in the next couple slides, I'd like to illustrate a more practical example of why you might care about the difference between delay and group delay. So what we're showing here is the very, very front end of an optical receiver with all of the passive interconnect and passive components between a photodiode that is modeled as shown in this light gray inset here as a current source with a time varying current that depends on the illumination level and a parallel capacitance and some other series impedances modeling that photodiode. Uh, and then the model here includes a solder bump and a via going to a trace on a package, going to another solder bump and another via, connecting to a pad on uh, integrated circuit, and followed by a T-coil whose design in this example we're trying to optimize. So the idea here is with all this passive network in the front end, finally, uh, terminating in the input impedance of a trans impedance amplifier at the front end of the receiver, how shall we select the component values in this passive T-coil network here? Specifically, um, just to make the problem a little bit more tractable, we presume the constant coupling factor in the mutual inductances of this T-coil. We fixed K at 0.4 and we neglected the bridging capacitance CB. And we just asked the question, what T-coil inductances should I choose for these two coils here in order to afford us the best signal integrity from the optical signal coming into the photodiode all the way through to the current going into the trans impedance amplifier. And um, I've given the values incorporate that are used in this, this model here in the, in the preceding example. Um, and really the question is, what criteria should we use in optimizing those inductor values? We can do all kinds of sweeps and examine the signal integrity in all kinds of different scenarios, but what should be uh, our main criteria? We could select them to maintain constant magnitude response over a broad bandwidth, constant group delay over a broad bandwidth, or constant phase delay over a broad bandwidth, and maybe a combination of criteria. So, 
let's see what happens when we look at each of these criteria. So your intuition might be that we wish to maximize the 3db bandwidth of that passive network at the input in order to uh, optimize signal integrity. So here we're showing a plot where we've swept the values of L12 and L23 in the T-coil, and it's sort of a heat map. And the light yellow color here indicates that the highest 3db bandwidth is afforded by these value, these inductance values indicated here. Um, and we find that if we then adopt those inductor values for the T-coil, we get an eye diagram at the input to the transimpedance amplifier um, looking something like this. It's uh, good, but not certainly not great. Well, if instead we perform that same sweep, but this time say that we're interested in a 60 gigabaud per second system, and we therefore wish to minimize the delay variation across the bandwidth DC to 60 gigahertz, or alternatively, we wish to minimize the group delay variation across that same bandwidth. Now, in these cases, we would find different optimal choices of those inductor values, generally in the same parts of the plot, but um, slightly different values in each case. So this indicates that if this is our criteria for designing the T-coil, we would arrive at quite a different design point. But which design point is really better in terms of signal integrity? So these plots here give you a little bit more insight into those optimum design points. On the left, we see the group delay and delay response of the optimal T-coil front end um, that is designed for minimum delay variation. So we see the red curve, we see very little delay variation across the bandwidth of interest, whereas the group delay starts to vary significantly around the band edge, whereas the slightly different design point chosen to minimize group delay variation results in slightly more delay variation, but we avoid the uh, large variations in group delay around the band edge. So it's a trade-off with on the right here with slightly more delay variation, but less group delay variation. So to ultimately see which design point results in better signal integrity, it's useful to look at the eye diagrams that result. So again, here we're interested in a 60 gigabaud per second 4PAM waveform, and we see that the design point that minimizes delay variation results in the eye diagram on the left. The design point providing minimum group delay variation results in this eye diagram here on the right, and certainly both are better than what we observed by maximizing the 3dB bandwidth of the front end. So this suggests that in this case, minimizing delay variation would be a more useful metric for optimizing the T-coil at the front end here. Now you might say if signal integrity is what we ultimately care about, why not just um, do the sweeps and optimize the eye diagrams. Um, the problem is that generating eye diagrams while sweeping all these optimization parameters can be can take prohibitively long in simulation. So whereas um, just evaluating the delay variation or group delay variation across the bandwidth of interest is relatively quick linearized analysis. So uh, using these as criteria can be useful for automating design and allowing you to explore design spaces more widely. So although it's obviously worthwhile to understand the difference between LTI systems having constant delay and those having constant group delay in general, in many cases of practical interest, the two are very similar criteria and in fact can be equivalent. So specifically, let's note that for any single input, single output electrical network that's built entirely out of lumped components, that is inductors, resistors, capacitors, and voltage dependent current and voltage sources or current dependent voltage and current sources, you end up with uh, a rational transfer function with real valued coefficients as shown here. So transfer functions in this form will always be real valued at DC. You can see that just by substituting an S equals zero into this rational transfer function T. Since it's real valued at DC, it means that we have a phase shift of zero degrees at DC. So although in general, it's not true that ensuring constant group delay also ensures constant delay, 
It is true that with a rational transfer function in this form, ensuring constant group delay starting all the way from DC or very, very close to DC up to some high broadband frequency is practically the same as ensuring constant delay. And that's why you'll often see constant group delay used almost interchangeably with constant delay. But let's not forget the other part of the criteria for realizing a transfer function with a constant delay. Not only must it have a constant delay response over the bandwidth of interest, it should also have an all pass magnitude response, that is a constant magnitude response over the bandwidth of interest. So that's why you'll often see delay approximations with an LTI response in this form. That is the numerator and denominator polynomials are related in this way so that the odd order coefficients just have opposing signs and all the even order coefficients have the same sign. Uh, doing so ensures an all-pass magnitude response. You can verify that just by substituting in j omega for s here. In general, it will be true for any polynomial p. So if we can find a polynomial p, we can find the appropriate coefficients d that have a linear phase response over the frequency range of interest with a delay of d, let's say, then we can form the transfer function t in this form and ensure it has an all-pass magnitude response and an approximately constant delay of two times d all the way through the bandwidth of interest. And that's because the numerator and denominator will each be giving us additional phase shifts, um, providing a delay of d, so we have a total delay of 2d. So let's just take a look at the simplest possible example of a delay response, a first order delay response, and see how we can have low pass and all pass alternatives. A low pass first order response is shown here on the left. It's simply got one left half plane pole on the real axis. Such a low pass response can be formed, for example, by a simple RC network, such as the one shown here. And that's going to give us 90 degrees of phase shift and approximately linear phase response over some bandwidth and some, therefore some delay over that bandwidth. Instead, though, we can form the all pass response like the one shown here on the right. The result is we'll have 180 degrees of phase shift. So that extra phase shift, 90 degrees from the left half plane pole, or I should say minus 90 degrees, and an additional minus 90 degrees from the right half plane zero. And that can translate into twice as much delay over the same bandwidth. Such all pass responses could be formed, for example, by the RC network shown here. Now in this particular example, you'll see that some extra components are required to give us that zero. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. In fully differential circuitry, um, there's maybe very little or no overhead to making use of the numerator, in a sense, for the extra delay it can afford. So sticking with those very simple exemplar responses, we see over here on the left, their magnitude responses low pass response in blue. Note that this is plotted on a linear scale on the frequency axis. So the shape is maybe a little different than what you're expecting if you're expecting a Bode plot. But a linear axis is uh, used because it's, we'll see that it's easier to be able to tell when a phase response is linear using a linear axis. And of course the all pass magnitude response is constant at unity at all frequencies. The phase responses are shown here on the right so that we can, again on a linear axis, so we can clearly see the frequency range over which we've got a linear phase response and therefore approximately constant delay response. And you'll note that the all pass response has twice as much phase shift and therefore the slope is twice as steep. So we've got twice as much delay both within this certain bandwidth of interest limited um, well below the pole frequency. So taking the phase response from the last slide and dividing it by omega, we end up with a delay response shown here. Again, the all pass response we see has twice as much delay as the low pass response uh, and approximately the same bandwidth. We can also plot the group delay by looking at the slope of the phase response. And uh, again, we see twice as much delay for the all pass response. So I'd like to next point out the fundamental trade-offs that exist between the delay, bandwidth, and the order n of rational transfer functions approximating a delay. So let's think about if we wanna have a broadband constant delay from DC all the way up to some target bandwidth, which we'll call omega b, 
the phase response has to be linearly related to frequency so that it's decreasing from dc all the way up to omega b with a constant slope of negative dt which is the delay we're targeting rearranging that we just see that here again the phase response is linearly related to frequency all the way up to omega b so that at omega b we've got to have a phase shift equal to the delay dt times that bandwidth of interest um, so for an ideal very broadband delay we require a lot of negative phase shift at the frequency omega b however for an nth order rational transfer function in this form there's a maximum negative phase shift we can get we can get a negative phase shift of minus pi by two from every left half plane pole and another negative pi by two for every right half plane zero in the numerator so remember that we're guaranteed a phase shift of zero at dc but that at very high frequencies the maximum phase shift we can get is negative n times pi where n is the order of the transfer function and that is the number of poles and the number of zeros we get pi by two from each pole pi by two from each zero so a total of n times pi phase shift so that then places an upper limit on this delay bandwidth product that we can have with a rational transfer function of order n so here i've drawn a cartoon sketch of what would be the absolute best case piecewise linear phase response we could hope to get from an nth order rational transfer function approximating a constant broadband delay now you could never achieve this kind of cartoon sketch in practice but this is just a thought experiment to illustrate that there's an absolute upper limit on the delay bandwidth product that we can get uh, from a rational transfer function of order n so if it's an all pole response that is it's low pass and there's no zeros in the numerator no finite zeros then we're going to get at high frequencies a phase shift of negative n times pi by two and so the best we can get in terms of a constant group delay and constant phase delay would be to have the phase a linear function of frequency up to that upper limit and then constant thereafter so that would mean we've got a ba the bandwidth of our delay approximation would be n times pi divided by the delay dt um, and we would get a slope here a delay of negative dt over 2 so only half of dt would be the delay we'd achieve on the other hand if we make use of zeros as well to give us extra phase shift we could have twice as much phase shift and therefore twice as steep a slope and twice as much delay in that case we could get the full delay negative dt here with that same bandwidth n pi over dt so the absolutely highest delay bandwidth product one can get from an nth order rational delay approximation is n times pi here so again uh, for a constant order n we've got an upper limit on the bandwidth we can achieve for a given delay or an upper limit on the delay we can achieve for a given bandwidth now in any practical rational transfer function the delay bandwidth product we get is going to be less than this limit so the question is how can we find rational transfer functions that can be realized with actual practical lumped circuit elements to approximate this perfectly linear phase response or this piecewise linear phase response and that then is the problem of delay approximation now i think most people will be more familiar with transfer function filter approximations that are used to approximate magnitude responses for example a low pass response such as the one shown here here we're plotting magnitude response versus frequency and uh, think of the case where we're trying to achieve a really ideal low pass response but we know we can't do that with a finite filter order n so i just want to talk about this magnitude response approximation problem because again most people are more familiar with it and we'll see that there are very strong analogies between this problem and what we're trying to do which is approximate a constant delay response so we know that for example with a third order response a third order filter we can't get this brick wall response but we can approximate it with for example a butterworth response which is plotted here in blue butterworth responses are designed to maximize the number of zero derivatives of this magnitude response uh, at 
the origin at DC in this case. So the maximum number of derivatives we can set to zero is just limited by the filter order n. In this case, n equals three. That gives us three equations with three unknowns, the three transfer function coefficients. And then we solve those three relationships to find the butter with third order butter with response. Uh, alternatively, there are other types of low pass magnitude response filter approximations that can be used. The Cower, uh, also known as elliptic response, is also plotted here in green. And that one is designed, again, to approximate this brick wall low pass response, but using slightly different criteria. Rather than to achieve a maximally flat response, the elliptic response allows some ripple in the passband, but tries to achieve the steepest possible roll off beyond the passband edge. So there's a kind of an equal ripple character to the magnitude response with elliptic filters. So we'll see that there are analogies between these filter approximations and those that are used to approximate constant delay responses. So specifically, there are a couple of types of transfer functions that we use to try to approximate constant broadband delays. One is called the Bessel response. These are rational transfer functions designed to ensure that the group delay is maximally flat at DC rather than the magnitude response. But similarly, again, we take the first n derivatives of the group delay, g, of our transfer function, set them equal to zero, and then use those n equations to solve for the transfer function coefficients. So this is a so-called maximally flat group delay response. Um, we can use either all pass or low pass variants of this depending on what we want from the magnitude response. Alternatively, we can also make use of equal ripple delay transfer functions uh, of any order. Uh, these are rational transfer functions designed to keep G, the group delay, bounded within a specific range over as wide a bandwidth as possible, but allowing for some ripple of the group delay within that bandwidth. Uh, unfortunately, unlike elliptic filters, there's no closed form solution for this. The coefficients are the result of optimization procedures. Generally, as is the case with elliptic filters, they afford a higher bandwidth than the maximally flat response uh, and while keeping the same delay, or they can give us higher delay for the same bandwidth. The trade-off is, again, that the delay response has some ripple in the passband rather than having the maximally flat character of the Bessel response. Now in both cases, if we allow a higher filter order n, we're gonna have more degrees of freedom and we're gonna be able to realize higher delay for the same bandwidth or higher bandwidth for the same delay. So that fundamental delay bandwidth trade-off is always there. It's just that these are designed using different criteria to try and approximate the ideal delay as closely as possible. So just to give you a feel for these different constant delay approximations, let's look at third order examples of them. And over here on the left, we're plotting the delay response, normalized delay on the y-axis uh, versus a normalized frequency axis on a linear scale on, uh, on the x-axis. Now the Bessel responses are plotted in blue and we see that when we use a low pass Bessel response, we achieve a certain bandwidth for the normalized delay of one. But if we use an all pass variation of the Bessel response, which we can do by simply mirroring the denominator up to the numerator, as we showed a few slides ago, then you get a delay response uh, as shown with the dashed blue line. So we got the same delay with a higher bandwidth. We can always trade the higher bandwidth for higher delay over the same bandwidth. Uh, and you'll also note the blue curves have this nice flat looking delay response within our bandwidth of interest. By contrast, the equal ripple responses are plotted in red and you'll see that they achieve a higher bandwidth for the same normalized delay, but they do exhibit some ripple within the passband. They don't have this nice maximally flat characteristic. So the um, designer may prefer one or the other depending on their, their end goal and their circumstance. The trade-off is perhaps even more clearly illustrated with the group delay plots shown on the right. Again, the blue responses are the Bessel, nice maximally flat responses, whereas the equal ripple responses have a wider bandwidth for the same delay, but do have ripple in the passband. The examples shown here are 0.5 degree equal ripple responses, 
it's also pretty easy to find tabulated uh, equal ripple responses with 0 0.05 degrees ripple. So those responses will have less ripple in the pass band and a little bit less bandwidth. So let's just finish off this part of the presentation by summarizing some of the points we made about delay filter approximation. First of all, we pointed out that having a constant delay requires a linear relationship between the phase response of a transfer function and frequency, and that the slope of that linear response is the delay time, d. We'll also sometimes talk about the group delay of an LTI system, and we define that as the slope of the phase response as a function of frequency. We pointed out that whenever you've got a constant delay over any bandwidth of interest, that implies that we will also have a constant group delay over that same bandwidth of interest. Moreover, if we have constant group delay starting all the way from DC up to some bandwidth of interest omega b, then we can also be assured that we have constant delay over that same bandwidth. But a small detail is that it's just not necessarily the case that if we have constant group delay over some bandwidth that's not starting at DC, then it's not necessarily the case that we have constant delay over that same bandwidth. Remember the example we showed where there was a difference between constant delay and delaying the envelope of the response. Now, for rational responses T, remember that there's a fundamental trade-off between delay, bandwidth, and the order of the rational transfer function N. Specifically, the delay bandwidth product is N limited below N times pi. And in practice, we're actually limited quite far below this limit. Different delay filter approximations come closer to this limit than others, depending on the criteria used to choose the numerator and denominator coefficients. Thanks for watching this first part of the presentation. Next time, we'll continue on and take a look at continuous time delay circuit implementations.